All right, buckle up. It's time for the SVD. Let's get right to it. Any matrix of any shape can be decomposed into the product of three matrices, U, sigma, and V. The first matrix U has orthonormal columns. Those columns are called the left singular vectors of A. The last matrix V also has orthonormal columns, and those columns are called the right singular vectors of A. Notice that there's a transpose on V in the product U sigma V transpose. We could have defined the matrix V without the transpose, but by the end of this lecture, you'll see why it's much more natural to put a transpose there. Finally, the matrix in the middle is a diagonal matrix. The elements along the main diagonal are all positive, and they're called the singular values of A. Just to remind you, since this is a diagonal matrix, all the elements not on the main diagonal are zero. Right now, this all seems very abstract, but let's start by just looking at the shapes of these three matrices. The matrix A can have any shape at all, and U will have the same number of rows as A. On the other hand, V transpose will have the same number of columns as A, which is the same thing as saying that V has the same number of rows as A has columns. The interesting thing, though, is the shape of sigma. Since it's a diagonal matrix, it's a square matrix. Because of matrix multiplication, this means the number of columns of U will equal the number of rows of V transpose, and that means that U and V have the same number of columns. Altogether, this means that for any matrix A, the number of left singular vectors and the number of right singular vectors will always be the same. Also note that U and V are not necessarily orthogonal matrices. They always have orthonormal columns, but it's clear from this picture that U and V are not always square. Just to really hammer in the point, this means that U transpose U is the identity matrix, V transpose V is also the identity matrix, but in general, U U transpose and V V transpose do not equal identity matrices. One more fact about sigma is that we can sort the singular values in descending order along the main diagonal without loss of generality, as long as we swap the corresponding columns of U and the corresponding columns of V to keep the matrix A unchanged. We saw the same property for the spectral decomposition. Just to put some names on these sizes, if A is an R M by N, then U is an R M by R, sigma is a square matrix in R R by R, and V is an R N by R. Since U has orthonormal columns, R must be less than or equal to M. And since V has orthonormal columns, R must be less than or equal to N. Taken together, this implies that R must be less than or equal to the minimum of M and N. At this point, you might be wondering how we know we can break down any matrix into the product of these three matrices. How can we prove this? Well, I'm going to save that for the end, but until then, I think it's important to get some more intuition behind the SVD and to see how it can be useful. First, let's check out the SVD in NumPy. I've got a tiny Python script here that creates an arbitrary matrix A. After that, you can see we call np.linelg.svd and pass in our matrix. With just this one line, we get out U, S, and V. There's just one thing to be careful of. S is actually an array of the main diagonal elements. It's not a matrix. We can generate the diagonal matrix sigma by just passing S into np.diag. Now let's print all the matrices. You should verify yourself that all the matrix sizes line up correctly. To get back our original matrix A, we would just multiply U, S mat, and V transpose. Also notice that NumPy's SVD function sorted the singular values for us. So now you're used to the shapes of the matrices involved, but how can we visualize what the SVD really is? This picture here says it all. They happen to use M instead of A for the arbitrary matrix, and if you look at V, you'll notice a weird little star on it. For our purposes, you can just think of this as the transpose of V. So first concentrate on the top arrow labeled M. On the left side, the blue circle represents all possible unit vectors in 2D. Since unit vectors all have unit length, we get a circle. Out of this set of infinitely many vectors, we're going to follow two particular vectors, yellow and red, when we multiply them by the matrix M. Going to the top right, we see the blue circle gets stretched, distorted, maybe even rotated. 
anything could happen since M is an arbitrary matrix. In general, the yellow and red vectors get scaled and rotated when we apply M. Now let's go back to the top left and take the long way around to the top right. We start with our original undistorted ball of unit vectors, and we first multiply them by V transpose to reach the bottom left. V has orthonormal columns, which means that we simply rotate the unit ball by some amount specified by V. There's no scaling involved, just a pure rotation. After that, we multiply by sigma. Since sigma is a diagonal matrix, it can't perform any rotation, and it simply scales the current axes by the singular values. The action of V transpose basically lined up the unit ball with the right singular vectors, which represents a different coordinate system. The matrix sigma simply scales our unit ball by possibly different amounts along each of these new axes. In this example, it looks like sigma 1 is greater than 1, so we stretch the unit ball along the x-axis, and sigma 2 looks smaller than 1, so we compress the unit ball along the y-axis. Finally, we apply the matrix U, which again has orthonormal columns, so it's a pure rotation. However, in general, U is not the same as the inverse of V transpose. It could be a completely different rotation. Whatever U is, we rotate the unit ball and we end up at the top right again. Whether we take the top path, which is multiplication with the original matrix M, or the bottom path, which involves the SVD, we get the same output. In summary, the effect of any arbitrary matrix on the unit ball is always 1. Rotate or reflect. Orthonormal columns can also produce a reflection, not just a rotation. Then 2. Stretch or compress along the new axes. And finally 3. Rotate or reflect by a possibly different amount. Sometimes people abbreviate this as rotate, stretch, rotate. That's what the SVD is all about. Now, since any vector can be represented in terms of unit vectors, this picture shows us how any arbitrary matrix will affect any arbitrary vector. This is incredible. I mean, this is such a massive discovery. It feels so good to synthesize every single concept we've discussed in all previous lectures into just one simple picture. If you've been paying close attention, you'll notice that the spectral decomposition is a special case of the singular value decomposition. Specifically, for spectral decomposition, U and V are the same matrix. We rotate, stretch, and then rotate back to where we started. But for the SVD in general, we rotate, stretch, and then possibly rotate off to somewhere else. Okay, that was exciting. But, but, what exactly are singular values? I just threw them at you, but I haven't actually explained what they are yet. Simply put, they're the generalization of eigenvalues. Only square matrices have eigenvalues, but arbitrary rectangular matrices, all matrices, have singular values, and they play a similar role. One interesting fact, which we'll develop further in a few minutes, is that the singular values of a matrix A are actually equal to the square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose A. Another interesting fact is that the singular values are also equal to the square roots of the eigenvalues of A A transpose. Putting these two facts together, for any matrix A, the matrices A transpose A and A A transpose have the same eigenvalues. One more quick fact about singular values I want to mention is that if you go back to the definition of the matrix norm from the last lecture, you'll realize that it's equal to the greatest singular value of the matrix. If the singular values are sorted, this is just sigma 1. It doesn't get simpler than that. Don't just take my word for it, go back to the definition of the matrix norm and verify this yourself. Now we're going to get into some mathematical applications of the SVD. This is where we're going to see more clearly just how useful the SVD is. The first thing we'll introduce is the condition number of a matrix. The condition number of A is denoted by kappa, and it's equal to the greatest singular value divided by the least singular value. We can write this simply as sigma max over sigma min. Since sigma max is greater than or equal to sigma min, note that the condition number is always greater than or equal to 1. This simple expression says a lot about a matrix. The condition number measures the sensitivity of a matrix and is useful in error analysis. 
Specifically, we say that the matrix is well conditioned if the condition number is small, so if it's close to 1, and we say that the matrix is ill conditioned if the condition number is large, so if it's much greater than 1. The singular values of a matrix tell you how much a vector along the corresponding direction will be stretched or compressed. A well conditioned matrix stretches input vectors by roughly the same amount no matter what direction they're in. On the other hand, an ill-conditioned matrix stretches or compresses input vectors by very different amounts depending on their direction. A well-conditioned matrix represents a stable, easy-to-predict system. Now here's another way to appreciate the significance of the SVD. We can rewrite the SVD as the sum of dyads. When we talked about spectral decomposition, we saw dyads too, and each dyad was made up of an eigenvalue times its corresponding eigenvector times the same eigenvector transposed. But with the SVD, we have u and v instead of just one eigenvector showing up twice. Each dyad in the SVD is a singular value times the corresponding left singular vector times the corresponding right singular vector transposed. This reveals an important truth. Any matrix is just the sum of dyads, which, as you know, are rank 1 matrices. Now notice that the sum only goes up to r since we have r singular values. That makes sense. And since our matrix is the sum of only r dyads, this means that the number of singular values is just the rank of a. Now you see why I've been using the letter r to represent this variable. So this is really fantastic. If you ever have to deal with some new matrix, whether someone gives it to you or whether you spot one in the wild, you can immediately find its rank by computing the SVD in NumPy in one line and checking how many singular values there are. And if it isn't clear by now, the SVD generalizes the spectral decomposition to arbitrary matrices. But here's the thought. What if we only added some of the dyads together? Instead of adding up all R of the dyads, what if we stopped early? This line of questioning is going to lead us somewhere amazing. Let's consider the problem of finding the best rank k approximation of an arbitrary matrix. This seems like an unrelated topic, but you'll see it's closely related to dyads. So we're given a matrix, and we want to find another matrix of the same shape that has only rank k, where k is less than r, the rank of the original matrix. We want this rank k matrix to be the best approximation to the original matrix out of all the possible rank k matrices of appropriate shape. Okay, but what does best mean? We mean best in the sense of minimizing the matrix norm of the difference matrix. In symbols, this is easy to express. Find the rank k matrix, let's call it ak, that minimizes the matrix norm of a minus ak, where a is our original matrix. So spend a minute here and make sure you really understand what this problem is asking for. So I'm just going to give you the solution. It turns out that the best matrix ak is just the sum of the first k dyads from the SVD. We just add up the dyads that have the k greatest singular values. If I want the best rank 3 matrix, I just add up the first 3 dyads. Super simple, super clean. This result is known as the eckhart young mirsky theorem. You know a theorem is important when 3 people have their names attached to it. I won't go over the proof of this, but you can easily look it up and you already have all the linear algebra knowledge needed to understand the proof. Another incredible fact is that this same result produces the optimal rank k approximation for not just the matrix norm, but also for the Frobenius norm. So if we changed our definition of best to be the Frobenius norm of a minus a k, our optimal matrix a k would still be given by the same expression. So we've solved the low rank approximation problem with an exact closed form solution. But there's something else amazing about this solution. It turns out the error of the optimal low rank approximation actually has a simple closed form as well. We can figure it out by just plugging back in our expression for ak into the matrix norm of a minus ak. You can simplify that into just one sum of dyads, where our index i starts from k plus 1 and ends at r. But this new sum is just another matrix, and the matrix norm of any matrix is just the biggest singular value. What's the biggest singular value of this new matrix? It's just the first singular value in the sum, which in this case is sigma k plus 1. Wow, that is clean. The error of the optimal rank k approximation is exactly equal 
to the k plus first singular value of the original matrix. What does this mean in plain English? It means the error is exactly the biggest singular value of the matrix we left out of A, right? Since AK is a matrix we made by adding together only some of the dyads in the SVD of A, that means we can write A as the sum of AK plus the sum of all the dyads we left out. What's the error of the optimal rank K approximation? It's just the matrix norm of the leftover matrix. Man, so many satisfying results in this lecture. So at this point, you have a taste of just how much useful info is packed into the SVD, and what the singular values and singular vectors are all about. We're now ready to tackle the proof, but first, let's quickly introduce one last tool. The full SVD. This is just like the full QR factorization versus the thin QR. All we have to do to generate the full SVD is append more orthonormal column vectors to U until the U is a square matrix. This means U becomes an orthogonal matrix. We do the same thing for V, so V becomes an orthogonal matrix. Lastly, we just make the matrix sigma bigger by filling it with zeros until its shape makes the matrix multiplication work out. Now this means sigma is no longer a square matrix in general. Note that this leaves the matrix A unchanged, since the zero singular values make the new column vectors of U and V disappear in the sum of dyads. The SVD we've been working with until now is called the thin SVD or the compact SVD. We only keep the non-zero singular values and their corresponding left and right singular vectors. By the way, NumPy's SVD function can return the full SVD for you if you just set the appropriate flag. The main advantage of working with the full SVD is that U and V are orthogonal matrices, so they have inverses. We're going to rely on this property in a minute. Okay, time for the meat of this lecture. We will prove that the full SVD exists. We will prove that any arbitrary matrix can be broken down into U times sigma times V transpose. The proof is actually pretty short and simple, but it only looks that way because we've spent so many lectures building up our tool set, and by now, our tools are very sophisticated. Let me start with a brief roadmap of the proof. Step 1. Get the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of A transpose A. Remember that the singular values of A are equal to the square roots of the corresponding eigenvalues of A transpose A. We will also show that the eigenvectors of A transpose A are also equal to the right singular vectors of A. Step 2. Use what we got from step 1 to define the left singular vectors of A. It's crucial to understand that this is a definition. However, we will show from this seemingly arbitrary definition that these left singular vectors are actually the eigenvectors of A, A transpose. In step 3, our final step, we simply rewrite step 2 in matrix notation, and the SVD will just pop out. It's gonna be beautiful. Let's jump into it. In the top right corner, I'll keep track of which step we're on. So, step 1, our goal is to get the right singular vectors and the singular values of our arbitrary matrix A. So, let's start with A transpose A. This matrix is symmetric and positive semi-definite. This is why we had a lecture on quadratic forms before this. Now we can apply the spectral decomposition to A transpose A. Since it's PSD, remember that its eigenvalues are all non-negative. We can write out the spectral decomposition in matrix form, but let's switch to dyad form. Since lambda i are all non-negative, let's just define sigma i so that sigma i squared is equal to the corresponding lambda i. That's all the singular values are. It's just a redefinition. Let's also call these eigenvectors vi the right singular vectors of our matrix A. Be sure to keep straight which terms apply to A and which terms apply to A transpose A. To wrap up this step, Notice that for any particular right singular vector vi, we have a transpose a times vi equals lambda vi, which just equals sigma i squared vi, using our new terminology. Now here comes step two. Our goal is to define ui, the left singular vectors. This is the most crucial part of the proof. We will define ui according to this equation. Sigma i times ui equals a times vi. So we have our original matrix A, we have all of our singular values, and right singular vectors from step 1. And now we define ui to be the vectors that satisfy this equation for each i. Now this is not some random definition. 
It's a very clever definition with some key properties. First, note that sigma i ui is an eigenvector of a a transpose. Since sigma i is a scalar, of course this means that ui is also an eigenvector. Let's take a few seconds to show this. We just multiply a a transpose by sigma i ui. From our definition, we can replace sigma i ui with a vi. Do you see what's happening here? We now have a transpose a in the middle, and vi is an eigenvector of a transpose a. Specifically, it's an eigenvector with eigenvalue sigma i squared from step 1. Since sigma i squared is a scalar, we can move it out front. But we see that a vi can be swapped out for sigma i ui using our definition again. Now it's clear that sigma i ui is an eigenvector of a a transpose, and the associated eigenvalue is sigma i squared. This also shows that a transpose a and a a transpose have the same eigenvalues, as mentioned earlier. The second property of ui that's relevant for us is that ui is a unit vector. To show this, multiply sigma i ui with its transpose. If we substitute in our definition, this is equal to a vi multiplied by its transpose. On the left hand side, I've distributed the transpose, and since sigma i is a scalar, I can pull it out. And ui transpose ui is just the norm squared of ui. On the right hand side, I also distributed the transpose, and I get a transpose a in the middle. I think you know what to do here. vi is an eigenvector of a transpose a, so it becomes lambda i vi. Lambda i is a scalar, and we pull it out front. But remember that vi is a unit vector. Why? Because the spectral decomposition produces unit vectors. So vi has been a unit vector all along. But only now does this property matter. So vi transpose vi is just the norm squared of vi, which is 1 but lambda i is really just sigma i squared. So we're left with this nice expression. Now, don't just immediately cancel sigma i squared from both sides. Let's be careful here. The spectral decomposition of a transpose a can produce eigenvalues that are zero. So sigma i could be zero. And we can't just divide both sides by zero here. But if sigma i were zero, then any vector, any vector at all, would satisfy this equation. ui would not have a unique solution. However, let's agree that when sigma i is zero, we will choose this ui such that it's a unit vector and it's orthonormal to all the other ui. If you go back a few slides to the full SVD, we really could have appended any column vectors we wanted to the matrices u and v. We restricted ourselves to choose the additional column vectors in such a way to make u and v orthogonal matrices. We're just doing the same thing here. So with that understanding, let's go ahead and divide both sides by sigma i squared. Now we've shown that all the vectors ui are unit vectors. I was very careful not to divide by zero here, because I've seen a lot of proofs out there that gloss over this step and do mistakenly divide by zero. So watch out for that. Okay, so much for step two. We've shown that ui are in fact unit eigenvectors of a a transpose, and we will call ui the left singular vectors of a. Here we go, step three, rearrange. Let's just take our definition of ui from step two and write it out in matrix form for all i. So on both sides here, we just have a matrix with n columns, one for each value of i, nothing special here. But now we're gonna use a little trick. The right hand side is easy to understand. We just factored out the matrix a, but the left hand side takes a second to grasp. I've pulled out the singular vectors into their own matrix. It's filled with zeros everywhere except for the main diagonal. On the very left, I've gathered the ui into their own matrix, where each ui is its own column. Take a minute to verify that this matrix product is equal to what we started with at the top left. This is just a matrix multiplication trick. They're completely equivalent. I drew the sigma matrix as a square matrix here just so it wouldn't take up the whole slide, but note that in general, it's not a square matrix. Going back to our picture of the full SVD, we could have several rows of zeros at the bottom of this matrix, however many rows we need to get the multiplication with the matrix U to work out. Let's clean this up and just write this equation with matrix variables. U times sigma equals A times V. But remember that V is an orthogonal matrix, since we have the full set of VI from the spectral decomposition of A transpose A. So we can multiply both sides by V transpose. 
And there you have it. An arbitrary matrix A can be decomposed as U sigma V transpose. That is just beautiful. This proof wasn't that long, but there are a lot of subtle points. If you've made it this far, you should be really proud of yourself. I mean, you've learned a lot. If you could follow every step of this proof, if you can clearly explain each step to yourself, then you really have a deep understanding of linear algebra. That's it for the proof, but I just want to close this section with some insight into how people came up with this proof. When you look at math proofs, people pull all sorts of obscure tricks out of their ass, and it makes it seem like you could never do that unless you're some kind of genius. But that's not how proofs get developed. There's a lot of exploration and meandering and dead ends. After they've finally figured out the right strategy, mathematicians will write up their proof in a short, tight set of steps that usually is not even close to the long, winding path they actually took. So for the existence of the SVD, let me give you some insight into what inspired this proof. Let's start out by assuming that the SVD exists. If we already had the full SVD of A, how could we compute U and V? Well, if we looked at A transpose A, and replaced A by U sigma V transpose, and distributed the transpose, and remembered that U is orthogonal, we'd get this. But take a look at the sigma transpose. Sigma is a diagonal matrix, so sigma transpose is just sigma. And remember that multiplying a diagonal matrix with itself is just the same as squaring all the main diagonal elements. Since this is the full SVD, sigma might not actually be a diagonal matrix, but since the bottom rows are all zeros, the zeros in sigma transpose and the zeros in sigma will all cancel each other out to become a diagonal matrix with sigma i squared along the main diagonal. More importantly, u is completely gone. We only have v and sigma. This is why we use a transpose a in the proof. Similarly, if you looked at a a transpose, you could simplify it down to u sigma squared u transpose, so we've eliminated v. This gives us a big hint as to how the left singular vectors ui should be defined in the proof. I hope this has demystified the use of a transpose a and a a transpose in the proof. Okay, enough proofs. We're going to cover one last topic, and believe me, this is the mind-blowing part. The SVD is deeply connected to the least squares and least norm solutions we studied earlier, and this is actually very easy to show. We'll start with least squares. To remind you, here's A dagger, the more Penrose pseudo inverse of A, in the case where A is skinny. This is the least square solution. Let's just substitute the full SVD everywhere we see A on the right hand side. This expression looks complicated, but if we just distribute all the transposes, it will simplify into something real nice. I suggest you try it yourself before seeing the answer. You'll see in the middle that we conveniently have U transpose U which is just the identity matrix, since u is an orthogonal matrix. Now we've got sigma transpose sigma, but sigma is a diagonal matrix, so this is just sigma squared. For the full SVD, sigma may not actually be square, but as we've already seen, it will just have zeros in the extra rows, and sigma transpose sigma will produce a diagonal matrix anyway. We need to distribute the inverse now, but since v is an orthogonal matrix, the inverse of v is just v transpose. Since sigma squared is now definitely a diagonal matrix, its inverse matrix just has the reciprocals of the main diagonal elements. Now in the middle, we're left with sigma to the negative 2 times sigma. Again, since sigma is a diagonal matrix, we can pretty much treat sigma like a scalar, so we can add the exponents, and we're left with just sigma to the negative 1. That's a pretty nice result. Go through this derivation nice and slow if you need to. Now let's look at the least norm solution. A is now fat instead of skinny, and A dagger is this expression here. Just plug in the SVD and simplify. I'll breeze through the steps here, but try it on your own using the same reasoning as before. As we get closer and closer to the answer, you'll gradually realize where this is all going. And wow. What is that? That, my friends, is the same expression as before. Whether A is skinny or fat, whether we're doing least squares or least norm, the more Penrose pseudo inverse is actually the same expression in terms of the SVD. This expression is called the generalized pseudo inverse of A. Instead of having two different expressions for A dagger, depending on whether A is skinny or fat, 
we now realize it's really the same expression. This means that least squares and least norm are really the same thing. How fucking sweet is that? The problem statements might appear different, but at some deep level, they're really two facets of the same concept. We no longer need to worry about whether A is skinny or fat. The generalized pseudo-inverse will take care of that for us. Wow. When I said the SVD brings together everything in this course, I really meant everything. We did it. We finally did it. We got to the SVD. But I've got just one more lecture in this series, and this is the real payoff. We're going to look at practical applications of the SVD, including applications in computer vision. The images we'll look at will make clear in a very dramatic way why the SVD is so useful.